Three, two, one. All right. Welcome into the Pucks with Hags podcast. Uh, Joe Haggerty. I'm here with my co-host, Jimmy Murphy. And today, we've got longtime NHL enforcer, good friend of the program and Murph and Hags, Sean Thornton, author Sean Thornton, Fighting My Way to the Top by Sean Thornton right there. I've got my copy here. Uh, I, I, I got to be honest, Thorny. A, where was my phone call to write this book with you before you went to running to Dale Arnold? <laughs> B, did you ever envision yourself as author Sean Thornton? No, I did not. Uh, I'll answer B first. I did not. <laughs> and uh, I didn't go running to anybody. Uh, I was approached. Dale wrote that uh, Bruins book with Triumph Books, and they asked, uh, you know, they wanted him to do another book. Yeah, asked him if he had any anyone he thought might be an interesting story. He brought me up. I said no three times, I think, uh, <laughs> until I was convinced to do it. You guys know me well enough. No, I don't like talking about myself all that much or putting attention on myself. So it was a little bit of a, yeah, they had to strong arm me a little bit. What, like what was the, the end sort of impetus to, to doing the book? I mean, the, the theme I got in, in what I've read is just sort of, you know, believing in yourself, sort of like fighting the odds where, you know, you, you're not sure if you're going to make it or not, but you just keep sort of pushing through and maybe that, you know, people are going to find some inspiration in that. But what, what was your, you know, final thrust to do the book? No, nah, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head. Uh, I was convinced that, you know, my story is an interesting one as far as, you know, a little unique in how I got to the NHL and ended up having a fairly successful career. And I was never supposed to make it ever, um, but just, you know, worked as hard as I could to, to and willed my way into it. So if there's some inspiration for a kid that's you know not a superstar that isn't expected to make it anywhere, and he uh, ends up putting the work in and getting it done. Uh, I'm hoping 20 years from now somebody can say the book was one of the reasons that uh, they dug in, uh, and also giving back. I think uh, whoever reads it, I know I've been asked for years, "What do you want to be remembered for when you're done?" I, I always say not the two Stanley Cups, but the amount I was able to be in the community and give back. I think that's just as important as anything. Thorny, were there points, I mean, in your career where you start to think, yeah, I should jot down some memoirs here and, and some stories and kind of just maybe one day I'll go back and look at it? And is that part of this? Uh, I started two years ago in the minors, uh, but then I decided that those probably shouldn't be read. Uh, <laughs> they were published. <laughs> the, uh, no, you know what? This uh, The book was a little bit of a challenge due to the fact that we agreed to do it right before the pandemic. Uh, in January, I think. And the idea was to have Dale around, you know, my golf tournament, my charity event, maybe going to Toronto, hang out with my buddies for a couple of days, really just hot stove and, and tell stories and uh, have some stuff come out of it that way. And it ended up just being phone interviews for, you know, basically a year and a half straight uh, in between a new job that I have and a, and a new family. So it was, uh, it was a little bit of a struggle, but um, happy with how it came out. What, what was there anything that was particularly difficult to write about? I'm sure a lot of it was just because you, you, like you said, you don't like to talk about yourself. But were there areas that you had to go to that were hard for you? Yeah, uh, the Brooksy thing, obviously. I hate bringing that up. I hate the fact that that's what I'll be remembered for when I want it to be giving back and other stuff. Uh, I'm working hard. Uh, the rest of it, not really. I mean, I tried to bring in a bunch of my buddies that I'd played with or gotten to know over the years to kind of tell some of the stories too. So it wasn't just me you know, spouting off, talking about myself, that that was, that wasn't easy. And I, I had to be very adamant with Dale that it can't just be me being interviewed by you and then putting it on paper. I have to get some other voices in there to maybe tell some stories. So it doesn't look like, you know, uh, again, I'm slapping myself on the back and spraining my shoulder. So, uh, again, not easy. Uh, but uh, again, I hope somebody has some inspiration out of it. How, how is your, your view of that, incident with Orpic changed maybe from when it, when it right happened now that you've had time to reflect on it? Uh, my, my view hasn't really changed, <laughs> but uh, I, under, I understand the big picture, right? And I, I talk about it in the book until I saw the full soup to nuts, like 45 minutes of dead air, basically waiting to, for him to get pulled off the ice or it felt like 45 minutes. It, the, the optics, the severity of the optics weren't uh, alive and well in my head until until I saw that in my second hearing. Uh, and I guess, you know, I also know that there were some other things going on behind the scenes. I'm also uh, the poster child for an enforcer. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to say easy to throw the book out because Gary's talked to me about it and 
he was the ultimate professional through the whole thing. But, um, you know, I, I understand why it was done. I just still think it was a little severe. <laughs> well, let, let me let me talk for you a little bit, Sean, here, if I can. Like, I, I on it, and I wrote about it at the time. I, I really thought there was, you know, obviously the NHL was sort of trying to sweep out, fight, not get rid of fighting, but, you know, legislate it more, have less of it. And I think the enforcers were something that, they were trying to move on from, and it seemed like, you know, they were kind of almost looking for an incident there to, to make an example out of, because it, there was clearly uh, the NHL before that 15 game suspension and the NHL was a little different afterwards and you don't see enforcers around anymore. And they, you know, it, it happened pretty quickly right after that. And it did seem like, you know, maybe you got caught up in it a little bit after having a very honest career. Yeah. Maybe a little bit. I would, I would agree with that, but not done it. No, you, I saw in one interview though you, you you no longer get a pension now because of that too. Is that true? Uh, I get a pension, but I, I lose. So the NHL's newest pension is uh, you get a certain amount for the season, but if I, if you miss a certain amount of games, you lose part of that pension. So I mean, listen on the grand scheme of things, it's not going to make or break me, but it, it definitely would have uh, altered my opinion on whether I was going to go to a third uh, arbitration, uh, but. You know, the, the whole process, again, Gary was very professional the whole time. It was just, you know, how it was drawn out, how it seemed to be. I was kind of put my back against the wall. It's like, go join the team and you'll be able to play on this week and a half long road trip right at the end of it. Or you have to go to an arbitration. Now your six week suspension is probably an eight week suspension by the time you get to it. And I was like, you know, it's trying to weigh all that. So um, that again, what's done is done. I've moved on from it. Thorny, uh, let's go to some fun stories here. I, I remember right. when you came to the Bruins, uh, my dad, one time I came home from a practice and I was telling him, and he said, well, he, he's got to be named after the character in the choir. Man. <laughs> yes. So I remember I came in and asked you uh, about that. And sure enough, I mean, you want to tell our listeners uh, a little about that story? Yeah, it was my grandma, my late grandmother's favorite movie. My, my grandmother and my mom are both, both from Belfast. Uh, it's kind of funny that my story sort of emulates the the John Wayne character. I mean, I wasn't a professional boxer, but it was, a, I guess, suppose a professional fighter in my uh, in my walk of life. Um, so yeah, it was her favorite birth, uh, favorite movie growing up, and my parents named me after the character John Wayne's character in The Quiet Man. My sister's name is uh, Kathleen or Katie after uh, the other character. So uh, I didn't get, I didn't actually see it till I was I probably didn't see it till I was like fifteen or sixteen. Maybe because of the fighting scene, my, my parents didn't put it in front of me until then. But uh, it's a great movie; it's a classic. Yeah, yeah. He made me watch. I think when I was about seventeen, I've seen it about twenty times since. So yeah, worse characters to be named after. <laughs> that that uh, trip to Belfast is one of the I think high points of, of covering the team, covering that group uh, that you were with. Your mom, Christine, was there. Uh, with uh, everybody in holding court in the, during morning skates when you guys yes. were out there on the ice. I still remember her telling the story of uh, how when you were a kid and you were playing youth hockey up in Ontario and you'd get knocked down and you'd be down on the ice, she and your dad would be yelling, what would Don Cherry do right now to you on the ice <laughs> to get you to get up and go skating hard again? It's pretty funny getting the insight yeah. into what made John Thornton uh, tick. And tick, yeah. There's a few different things that uh, I don't know if, they'd be considered good parenting nowadays, but it definitely made me the <laughs> person I was. Uh, we used to get Don Cherry's Rock'em Sock'em from my grandmother every Christmas. So yeah, uh, that was, that was a big thing. We'd go over to the grandmother's house and open some presents. And then that went on while they were probably drinking and we were just staying busy watching Rock'em Sock'em in the uh, living room, just not bothering him. I think was probably the case. Nice. So what do you, um, you know, obviously when you came to Boston, you were sort of part of, uh, a renaissance, so to speak, or it kind of them re revisiting, recapturing their old identity. A and you clearly took it upon yourself to really help with that. If you can go back to that time and, and just tell, tell the listeners, the Bruins fans, what it was like to kind of reshape that culture at that time. Yeah. I mean, our first home opener, I think we had 11, five or 12,000 in the building. Uh, my, my first game with the bees, people forget those days. I really think they've been yeah. so, uh, so lucky the last 14 years or so, uh, or 13, whatever it is. Um, you know, we had a, a you got to give credit to, to Peter Shirelli. He understood the identity of a team that he wanted to put on the ice, and it matched with what the, the city probably wanted to see on the ice. Uh, you know, it wasn't just me that first year. We had me, Z, Jeremy Reach, Mark Stewart, uh, Luch. We had a lot of 
I'm probably missing some guys. Sheriff Shane Knighty, I think, came up that year or the year after. Um, mm -hmm. We had some guys that really just played some – Ference, too, sorry. Um, some hard-nosed hockey and hated to lose. So when we were losing, we made, it sure, we, we made sure everyone in the building knew we weren't happy about the loss uh, one way or another, I guess is my politically correct way to say it. Um, <laughs> so it just worked out that the city of Boston – you know, we identified with the city and uh, it was truly just the characters that he brought in that, that matched the the character of the city. Uh, and then, you know, you play Montreal in the first round in the first year. They're the best team in the league at the time. You take them to seven. There's some light at the end of the tunnel from what they've just been through. And then the next year we had a really good team and the year after year after year after and it just kept building. You were an integral part of, of a leadership group with that Bruins team that went to two Stanley Cup finals. One, one was, you know, a contender for a while. What do you think are the most important elements in a, a healthy, good dressing room for a team that, you know, has their sights set on something like that? I would say being aligned on the vision uh, and meaning playing the same way, uh, having the same outlook on what it takes to, to be a winner uh, off the ice, on the ice, um, and accountability. Uh, that room's the best I've ever been in for people holding each other accountable. Um, and I think we all wanted to play for each other, not for anything else. Are we uh, are we going to get you guys together in person for a oh, ten year I'd anniversary? Like, man, is, like, that, is that going to happen? I would like or what? to. I would like to. That uh, yeah, the Zoom call didn't do it justice. So uh, Shane Knighty was trying to work on something maybe in Vegas, but I don't know if all our wives are going to let us take off to go to Vegas and visit <laughs> Sheriff <laughs> for a <real> weekend. We'll, <laughs> we'll have to oh, see. that's nice of him to offer to host you guys in Vegas. That's pretty yeah, good. Yeah. yeah. He's got the connections there. Is there uh, still a, a group text going on with you guys, all the people on that team, and how's that uh, how's that going these days? They're, they're not since uh, probably like it probably died down about a week after we did that reunion on Nesson. Uh, still talk to a lot of the guys uh, on the side, but the group text uh, has it. Luch is actually the one who usually gets fired up. It's usually Luch sending something stupid <laughs> to the group and everyone uh, chirping each other off of it. That was great what he did with the beers, eh? In Vancouver. Yeah, and he yeah he's, he sent that to me before it got posted. I was like, I wasn't the one that leaked that. He's uh, he's an absolute <laughs> beauty. I, I had no idea uh, Soupy had all those guns a blazing from Marshan. He was like ready to go on that Zoom call with oh, you guys. Those, those two, I think one of them might have got overserved and uh, started. They used to chirp like that in the locker room all the time, though. They they're tighter than two coats of paint off the ice, but you get them together, they just start chirping each other. They can't stop them. They can't stop themselves. Speaking of chirping, um, we had Mike Rupp on last week. And by the way, he spoke very highly of you. Um, but he said, you know, you would come on the ice and you'd start, how the kids are, how's it going? And, you know, nice game. the other. And it was almost like he said, I couldn't tell if he was, he was setting me up or he was just really a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> he said, it turned out he's a nice guy. I mean, I fought him a couple of times, but he was as straight shoot as you could be. How, how much pride did you take, uh, in being that straight shooter and being a stand-up guy, you'd have to do your job fighting. But at the same time, you respected the other guy as well. Yeah, I had a lot of respect for Rupper. Actually, he was a good player too. Probably a better player than I was. He was big. I, I had a tough time with him. Actually, uh, could throw both hands. Smart fighter. He fought a lot like me. Only had three or four inches on me. So um, <laughs> he, uh, I wasn't messing with him. I, I mean, I had a good mentor when I was younger that taught me how to compartmentalize that part of the game. Uh, so mm -hmm. I had no problem being your best friend off the face off and then punch you in the face 10 seconds later, if it needed to be <laughs> needed to be done, it's just a job. Uh, so I don't, I, again, I had a good trainer when I was younger that taught me how to put myself in that space. And as far as a straight shooter, I, I still take pride in that. I'm in the office every day and uh, the people that work with me say, well, we always know where we stand with you, whether we like it or not, you always know where you stand. Uh, yeah. I'm as straight as it gets. How stressful was that job that you did every, every day? Just sort of the uncertainty, you know, if you woke up in the morning and you had a game that day, not knowing if you're going to drop the gloves. And I remember random times, sometimes, you know, you would text me to ask if a guy was going to be playing for the other team. <laughs> you know, I was covering morning skates there because you were kind of preparing just in case. But like, what was that like every day, not knowing for sure if it was going to happen or if you did uh, know you were definitely going to drop the gloves that night? You know what? In the NHL, you're doing it. 20 times a year maybe uh in the ahl i was doing it almost 40 times a year against guys uh maybe a little bit bigger scarier and for a lot less money so 
I, I've said this on the record a few times. It's uh, is a stressful job, yes, but every job has a little has a little bit of stress to it. Uh, some jobs mm -hmm. more than others. I mean, my friends are cops and police uh, or police officers, firefighters. Like they they have a way more stressful than my job, in my opinion. Uh, and I I wouldn't change it for the world. So. Yeah, was it a tough job? But so was the steel factory for the old man for 40 years. I'm sure he had stress trying to make sure he was paying the bills and not losing another finger while he was in there. So, um, listen, I, I got no complaints, no complaints whatsoever. Yeah. 40, uh, you, you mentioned the job now you're doing. Uh, what like what does that entail right now? What's it been like for you and what have you learned so far? Uh, it's been great. I, uh, I oversee most of the business operations for the Panthers. Um, I just negotiated our naming rights deal for our practice facility uh, with our healthcare provider, working on another naming rights. Uh, I oversee content. So we uh, we had our own sort of behind the B show uh, called Panthers on Cage. We won a telly for it last year. That, that all reports to me. And then f foundation community uh, all are reporting into me as well. So whatever fundraisers are doing, how we're giving back in the community, all, all that stuff. Uh, and I, I love it. I, I was very lucky as a player to, as you guys know, I was pretty tight with, you know, Matt Schmer, Amy Latimer, Chris Johnson, a lot of people at the bees. And when I got to Florida, I came really close with our COO and I really paid attention to the business side while I was playing. And uh, it definitely paid off when I came into this role. It's, much, it's a, go ahead, Marv. Uh, just how much did that change during COVID and, and what was it like? What did you learn from that whole experience? If I hear the word make goods, uh, one, the, the term make good one more time, I'm going to uh, pull my hair out. Uh, I mean, this is no word of a lie. Myself and a couple other guys on the sponsorship team on Christmas Eve, we're down in the arena measuring tarps, uh, making wow. sure that they're fitting right and had the right camera angles and all that stuff uh, to get the value back from what we had negotiated off these deals. Uh, so, but it, it taught us to innovate too, right? I mean, we had the first, uh, first virtual 5k in all of pro sports, which was pretty cool when you have like the yes. Dallas Cowboys and a couple other teams copying, uh, copying your idea and, uh, you know, we had to be innovative on how we brought back our season ticket holders. We were going to be the first team to have fans in the building until uh, the Dallas Stars caught COVID a week before the home opener. But oh, we, yes. uh, we were the first building in hockey to be well certified. We were the first we were going to be the first ones to have fans back in the stadium, socially distanced. Like you learn a ton and you definitely learn that you, you have to be on your toes and, and learn to innovate and, and push the envelope here and there. Pretty amazing uh, when you read the book and you sort of put yourself in, in your shoes, the uh, turning points that you had in your hockey career. You had to spend six years in the minors before, you know, you got a, a chance with the Blackhawks to at least play some NHL games. I think it was nine years right before you got really became a regular with the Ducks and you were thinking about becoming a cop. Uh, you know, you kind of at that crossroads where you, you weren't sure if you were going to keep going with hockey or, or go into police enforcement. And you know, now you're working for the Panthers. You're writing a book. You've won the cup a couple of times. Does yeah. it kind of blow your mind sometimes when you think about like sort of the crossroads and the what ifs of, you know, if you hadn't pushed through? Yeah. I mean, you had to get some breaks along the way too, right? Uh, definitely the Anaheim year, I was that was going to be my last year of pro hockey if I wasn't in the NHL. Uh, it was a little frustrating because I thought I was good, good enough to play in the NHL and uh, wasn't sure if anyone else thought that. Um, but it happened. Now, I will say if I started in the NHL when I was 24 with the Maple Leafs and had that much attention on me and I wasn't mature enough, like I'm not sure if I would have been able to play till I was 40 either. I might have been out of the league when I was 33, 34 years old and uh, who, who knows what I'd be doing now. So it gave me an opportunity to get to a, a city like Boston, get close to the people in the front office, really teach me some things to help me with what I was going to do on the other side. And I mean, as you guys know, when I was in Boston, I didn't know if every year was going to be my last. So I was setting myself up to do something. Uh, I ended up being this, but I was also working on whether it's broadcasting, podcasting, radio. Uh, I was always looking for the next step. And that's because I, I knew I was on borrowed time. Um, I'm not sure I would have been thinking that way earlier in my career if I had made it at a younger age. When you were who, going who were back some of the people that you sort of feel uh, indebted to just as far as the playing career goes that kind of either gave you a shot, you know, uh, helped you with advice. Like I'm sure there's a ton, but just there's, a few of those people. There is a ton. I would say uh, Lionel Ingleton uh, who passed away, but he was my mentor. He's the one that taught me how to compartmentalize and get ready for those, uh, those moments and taught me to push through any mental or physical boundaries I might've thought I had within myself. Like really there was no, he took you to another level. Um, and then all my coaches along the, along the way, I mean, my junior coaches, my first year, uh, Dave McQueen, he, he really, I wouldn't say protected me, but made sure I was set up to succeed 
Uh, he left in my second year. Brian Drum came in. I've known him since my days in Oshawa. He helped me play a little bit of D because he saw that I grew up as a defenseman. So, you know, gave me confidence and put me on the second line. And then you turn pro at uh, Al McAdam for, you know, my first three years. And he liked me better as a defenseman, kept me on the back end, really thought I was, uh, you know, put a letter on my shirt in my first year. And I mean, every coach I've had throughout my career has really helped me advance to be uh, another level of uh, individual and play and professional. So, uh, I mean, those are just a few, but Trent Yanni, same thing. He, the tough love I got from him was necessary at the time, uh, but he also had the confidence to put me out there in key situations. So uh, Mike Havlin took over when Jans went to the NHL and I mean, have treated me like I was his best player? It was, it was crazy. <laughs> I seriously, I'd play five on three PK as a defenseman. That'd be on the first power play. And, playing 20 something minutes a night in the AHL. Now, again, I was 28 years old and had you know 600 games down there at that point. So I think he just trusted they knew what he was getting from me every time. It was just consistent. Uh, but it gave me the you know confidence to know if I went to the next level I'd, in the NHL, like I can make plays. I can, I can do that. I don't need to be the fourth line guy that just gets pushed out in the ice and fights. I can actually contribute. Uh, going back on the stories when you're going through the book with Dale and you're starting to put things together, was there – was there one story that stood all above the rest in terms of humor and, and making you laugh? Like, wow, I can't believe that happened. Uh, not really in the humor stuff. Uh, well, you put me on the spot too, and I can't even remember. <laughs> I, I haven't read the book in like six months because when I, <laughs> I, had, I had to proof it so many times. Um, I will say the like the trip across St. John's, like from we played the Montreal Canadiens in like eight exhibition games and we started in new Lisker and then we oh, yeah. ruined Aranda and then yep. Grand Falls, Newfoundland. Like that is not normal. Like the <laughs> amount of fighting and violence and travel in these most obscure towns. Like, I don't know if that'll ever happen again, to be yeah. honest. And it really kind of blows my mind. And then yeah, every game, Tarion was tossing somebody, bringing guys up from the senior league and tossing them out there to come grab me. And, yeah, it was uh, it was another it was another world back then. Yeah. So so uh, you and Terry and still aren't on each other's Christmas card list? No, I did talk about the book though. I saw him probably literally a year and a half ago, right when I was starting to do like starting to wrap this book up, and he uh, grabbed me and shook my hand. He's like, "Hey, man, I really respect you as a player. I know we had our differences, but oh, you know, wow. you really reminded me of." Me and I felt like saying, "Well, yeah, I played a lot more games than you, so and it was way tougher." But I just said, "I just tipped my cap." It, it was it was a very professional thing of him to do, and it kind of, you know, I don't know, I've buried the hatchet. I'm still extremely pissed about some of the things that had to do with him behind yeah. the other bench. But uh, he was doing what he thought was best for his team, and he uh, he said, "You know, you know, he would do anything it took to win," and I was the same way. So I, it's probably not a mystery why we would have butted heads, even though he was a coach and I was a forcer. You should have just said, you're soft. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly thought I'd grab and choke him out the first time I ever saw him. <laughs> I've been doing jujitsu for a dozen years, but uh, I just shook his hand and said thanks. I loved uh, the way you opened the book with, uh, you know, the stories of everybody's perspective on the Matt Cook uh, game. Uh, you know, the first time you guys played the Penguins after his hit on Savvy. Just, you know, your mindset going into that game. And, and I just love the fact that you, you know, that was your job, your responsibility to have the backs and protect your teammates. And you felt like it was your job to go out there and, and take care of business with Cook and not let it spiral out of control where guys like Crosby and, and Berge and the, the skill guys out there were going to have to worry about their safety as well. Yeah, we had, listen, I played the minors for a long time. This isn't the first time I've seen something like that. Um, and I've seen it go – I had seen it go both ways down there where it was settled quickly or it was – never settled and you always had to look over your shoulder every single game uh you know not to take anything away from anyone else but i'm not sure he would have fought z and z might have actually killed him um yeah. and then next on the list was probably me and i thought he would fight me and then not that the guys were blowing me but some guys weren't quite as tough as me that definitely wanted to do it but i thought uh i would be able to inflict some damage without killing him so um <laughs> it was uh it was my job and you know billy garen being the ultimate professional just you know stepped up and and made it happen on their end too because he he understood uh, he'd been around the game for a long time I and mean, that that was our leadership group though right like you know we had me z bergy rex uh, everybody was on the same page on on basically how we were approaching every single day and every single game and that's just one more of those instances 
You know, you were just talking earlier in the show there, we were talking about the, the other hit there with Brooks and how maybe they were trying to phase out enforcers, like Hag said. You think about it, Thorny, like now, those those hits are still happening on what Cook mm -hmm. was doing. We still got guys doing that. And I wonder, is it because they know that they don't have to face the retribution? Do you think that plays a role? I, I personally do. I think that, you know, I, I know the league would probably prefer that the retribution would be out of their paycheck and that stings and all that stuff and, you know, games missed. And, but listen, in my opinion, intimidation is a part of life. It's only amplified inside that 85 by 200 uh, arena that you're playing in. And um, if you have something in the back of your mind that somebody might be breathing down your neck, the next time you step on the ice, if you did something a little offside, it, whether you want to admit it or not, people, people are going to think twice before they do it. Yeah. I agree. So Toughest, uh, toughest guy you ever fought in your entire career? <sighs> Bogeyman, probably. Derek Bugard. Just because well, he was I mean, so big? Yeah, he's big. John Scott, too. I mean, I should probably pick the guy that beat the wheels off me because so I look <laughs> so I look tougher. Uh, yeah, he was, those guys were those guys were big. You know, there's a – but, you know, then there's the pound-for-pound pound guys. Like, Bolts was tough as nails. You know, Chris Neal, tough as nails. Like, yeah. Uh, George, big George's. I, there's I fought a lot of guys. I mean, I had 400 and something between both both leagues, and it's tough to just pick one one or two guys out of that that crew. Was, was there a, a hardest punch you ever took from one of those guys that you remember? <clears throat> the hardest punch I ever took was in junior from a guy named Lee Cole that you never would have seen again. Uh, he, that was the only time I actually got hurt from a from a fight. Um, no, I mean, I'm trying to think. Bolts had pretty heavy hands actually. Uh, I did everything in my power not to get hit by those big guys. Uh, and I can't tell you, I don't really remember John Scott hitting me. So tough to, <laughs> tough to give you an opinion. <laughs> you brought, you brought up uh Lerac there. Go back. Remember what, what season was that? Oh, eight or nine when he was going after Luch and Luch just kept ignoring him. Yeah. They signed him right for, I mean, yeah. I, 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 I just I, literally I, for that. I think for the rivalry. Yeah. And yeah. I yeah, he was chasing him around the Bell Center ice. I remember yeah. that one. And I, man, I, Luch had some willpower, man. I'll tell you. Yeah, I remember we fought first shift. Uh, I remember he, he, Guy Carbono, whatever, he calling it out that Big George is in the building. And in my head, I was like, well, I've already fought the guy four, five times. Yeah. Like, you think I'm, I'm not losing sleep over this yeah, one? What's, like, the big deal? Okay, yeah. what's the big deal? Oh, he's <laughs> coming to get me. I mean, so uh, I respect George a lot. He was as tough as they come. He, uh, yeah. He, he was a big, big, strong guy. You were never out muscling him. You're, you know, never didn't see him get hit too often uh, because he was so strong. But again, what the fear of the unknown was kind of what got me. But if I had fought a guy four or five times and I'm still standing here to tell a story, like I'm definitely not intimidated by him, nor right. would I be when Guy says it on air. <laughs> Go ahead, X. <laughs> What uh? Let's let's get this one out of the way, and then we'll we got one final question for you after this. Right. What, what was the angriest you ever were at me or Murph during your uh, time in Boston? <laughs> nah, I was never really angry. I just like giving <laughs> you guys a hard that. time. I just like giving you a hard time. <laughs> Problem when Murph made me buy him a beer off the ice and didn't buy it for me. <laughs> <laughs> I still owe you a JMO shot, all right? Yeah, all right. I still remind, remember you at Madison Square Garden. I think you were uh, you had like a shoulder thing going on or something, so you didn't play that night. And you bought like fudgicles for me and the late John Martin and uh, brought them over to us in the press box. We really appreciated that. Right, anytime, anytime. No, I, I, <laughs> listen, the media in that city can be, you know, I won't say tough. It's uh, it can be overwhelming sometimes because it's it's always on. You're always on. You're always on. You can't get away from it, right? Like it's. It's not like being here in Florida where, you know, you just get a taste of it here and there. Uh, but I, I appreciated the media. I respected everyone in the media. And that's not, I'm a fairly popular player still in that town because I think I was always available for the media. So it, you don't get one without the other. Yeah, it's true. And uh, just finally, um, I know you, you, you can't give out any state secrets about Tuca, but <laughs> wrote the forward in your book. You've been really good friends with him for a long time. Just, how much do you hope he ends up coming back to the Bruins? Because I'm sure that's, you know, what he wants to happen. Yeah, I mean, I'll leave that up to him. Uh, he, he, I will say, you know, we, we both played in David's uh, charity golf tournament this week, and he looked pretty good. Uh, both our teams shot 14 under, so uh, I, could, I don't even nice. have bragging rights. Uh, we, uh, yeah, so he looks good. I'm hoping he comes back. I mean, he's skating with them, right? So um, 
I, but I, to be completely honest, I don't ask him about hockey too much. It's uh, he gets asked enough about hockey. I mean, we talk about our families and the golf game and what kind of IPA we're going to drink next if we're if we're uh, <laughs> if we're finished the round. Uh, and his his finished drink, long drink that I was supposed to invest in, and I didn't. And I'm still kicking myself. So uh, we talk about that stuff more than we uh, talk about hockey. I'm any, guessing. Any you, last question, Murph? Yeah, I'm guessing if you didn't have a log jam at the goalie position, you'd be recruiting him right now, huh? <laughs> I, I would never recruit. That'd be uh, <laughs> outside my. I, I stay all the business ops, but yeah, he. I mean, his old agents are GM, so somebody. Uh, and I know. She, yeah, our assistant GM was his last agent, so they know each other. But I don't. I, I don't know. It's that's not my purview. I'm. I stay on the business side. I'm trying to sell a name to the building right now. Not trying to sign goalies. <laughs> trying to make money not spend money there you it's go tough. one other thing he's trying to sell author uh, memoirs sean orth author of a memoir sean thornton here yeah uh fighting my way to the top awesome book i know tons of bruins fans and hockey fans are going to get it thorny thank you very much for the time hey thanks for having me guys good seeing your ugly mugs again <laughs> right. always a pleasure take it easy bud